Hey, Larry, how you doing? Great, Glenn. Nice to be with you again. Yeah, this is Glenn Lowry uh, at The Glenn Show at bloggingheads.tv. I am uh, the Merton Stoltz Professor of the Social Sciences here at Brown and uh, Professor of International and Public Affairs in the Watson Institute. And I'm talking with uh, Lawrence Kotlikoff, who is a professor of economics at Boston University, an old friend of mine, and uh, a leading uh, economist uh, commenting on public uh, affairs in this country. And uh, Larry, I, I need your counsel. I've asked you to come on the Glenn Show because the uh, COVID-19 virus is wreaking havoc with all of our lives. And I thought I would benefit from hearing your thoughts as an economist about uh, how we should be, uh, how, sh how we should be reacting to it. But first, I want to hear your thoughts as a person. Um, I understand that you and your lovely wife, Bridget, are uh, kind of like isolating yourselves from contact with any other human beings. And uh, that seemed to me initially at least a little bit extreme, but I, I don't know, man, as uh, the news comes in about how fast this thing is spreading and what tremendous impact it's having in other countries, I'm not so sure how to think about it anymore. What do you think? Uh, well, we had uh, just between yesterday and today, I think we had about a 15% increase in the number of U.S. cases now. That How can that be? How many cases were there yesterday and how many new cases are there today? And how do we know that? And why do we believe those numbers? Okay, well, I, I think that's those are good questions. So let me just uh, exact numbers here. Uh, the uh, where is this thing? Oh yeah, okay. So, so in the U.S., we have, according to a, a website called Worldometers. Yeah. Info slash coronavirus, which I think is connected to the CDC. We have uh, in the U.S. Uh, forty three seventy one four thousand three hundred seventy one cases that have been confirmed, and six hundred ninety one new ones between yesterday and today. So this may just be improved uh, testing. I'm Precisely. not sure everybody, 691 people got sick from one day to the next, but that's it. Uh, 31, that's a 15% increase. Uh, worldwide, there was a 6% increase in certain countries. So we had, um, you know, look at this statistic, 691 more people. In China, they only had 36 more cases. Uh, yes, yeah. Sir. Okay. So here's the measurement problem that I want to uh, focus your attention on. I'm sure you'll have something to say about this. If we right. don't really know the extent of infection because testing is not universal, some of the day-to-day -day increase in the number of confirmed cases will be cases that were already existing yesterday, but that have only right. been found because of the expanded scope of the testing, which allows us to have a more accurate assessment of whether any individual has gotten it. That's not a new case in the sense of the rate of growth of infection. That's a new case in the sense of our knowledge about the existence of the infection. But what we're interested in right. is the rate of growth of the infection, because that's telling us how likely it is that 10 years from 10 days from now, it'll be, you know, the exponential uh, continuation of that uh, of that rate of growth that you just estimated. So we could be underestimating, overestimating, I should say, the actual number of, of new cases by simply discovering cases that had not been discovered before. Do you see what I'm saying? Is that, is that not a reasonable concern? Yeah. Well, that's, that's the most likely scenario here. Uh, could also be underestimating uh, because we don't have new people have become infected and they thought they were, they think they're having a cold. They've got, minor symptoms because this thing presents with minor symptoms for a lot of people, especially young people. Uh, but even older people, uh, you know, may have minor symptoms for a while. And then, you know, five, six days later, bingo, they have trouble, trouble breathing. And I've even heard that people uh, need to be tested more than once because you can have a false positive or a false negative uh, on your first test. So, you know, the president was just declared uh, disease free, but uh, it's possible that he needs to have another test. 
and you could be well, there's no end to that. people with coronavirus. There's no yeah. end to that. Oh, no. no, I think I think the the fact that I think therein lies the solution to our problem here, which is this point that there is no end to that, uh, which is unless we have some mechanism to make an end to it, we'll have this on, ongoing forever. Because even if we quarantine people for a couple of weeks, so that there were no, you know, the people that were really sick basically uh, ended up getting sick and then got to the hospital or were tested, so they weren't spreading it. So let's say that's what you do, which is what Italy has been doing, and it's getting on to about two weeks that they're, they've done this. Uh, of course, their rate of increase um, has gone up dramatically. They have about a ten percent overnight increase in in uh, the number of people, number of new cases. So anyway, let's suppose you to, you quarantine everybody, lock everybody down for three weeks, and then you let everybody out because you say, okay, we've taken care of the problem. And then somebody sneaks into the border, through the border from, let's say, South America uh, uh, through uh, the new wall that Trump uh, has made permeable because they can you can take a, a, a cutter and you can apparently get through it. Um, <laughs> Anyway, and that person has coronavirus, and that person is like the guy in New York who infected 50 people within about a week. So what do we need to do to keep, and then we'll all we'll be back in the same boat again. So we can't have, a, as a country, continue to be quarantined nationwide for two weeks at a time every few, few months. That's, um, you know, if you have the entire country shut down for two weeks, that's two out of 52 weeks. That's 3.8% of the time. So if you think about that, output is down 3.8%. Output during the Great Recession declined uh, at its peak. At the, the biggest decline between peak to trough was 3%. So just shutting down the country for two weeks. Well, is well, hold on, Larry. What? what you did was you just counted the first order reduction in output associated with shutting down the country. You didn't count the multiplier effect of the reduction in output that would ultimately come about from the depression that could be engendered by the initial uh, cut. So you can't compare uh, output loss from a recession to output loss from a, a one-off uh, a reduction in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in production over the course of a, a couple of weeks. Those are apples and oranges. Am I wrong? Well, if you look at annual reduction in output, it was three percent at its max in the Great Recession, from one one year to you know from two thousand seven to whatever two thousand nine, output was down across those two years three percent. Yeah, and, and what I'm saying is, if you if you reduce uh, aggregate demand by two days worth of a uh, of, of production, two weeks, the, two, two weeks. weeks. I'm sorry, the, the net effect will be more than just that initial hit. You got to work the multiple. Oh, yeah. Work that through the multiplier. Oh yes, absolutely. People will. Um, this is a multiple equilibrium here. People will think that uh, uh, you know everybody will get into a depressed state, think we're in a bad equilibrium, and take actions accordingly. So you're absolutely right. At a minimum, it'll be worse than the Great Recession. Yeah, what I'm trying to get across. Okay. And and I think we're really heading to a depression because uh, you know look at what happened to uh, China's service industry in the last two months, it's gone down 20%. So if services in our country go down 20%, output GDP from services, and our, our country's uh, 78% of our GDP is coming from services. So a 20% hit on services for the year is 14% of GDP. Now, the Great Depression saw a decline of 25% of GDP. So we're all already something like a depression if we're talking about a 14% decline in GDP, and that's just services. There's other industries that would be affected. Look at, uh, uh, you know, airlines is not just services. Uh, I guess it's, uh, but they shut down. Uh, they're shutting, they're, ha- they're coming together with plans to shut down all domestic airline service. International flights are already being canceled. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, car production, I think Fiat Chrysler has shut down production. So this has just got this huge, yeah, you're right, multiplier effect of uh, uh, implication. And also there's the spare part issue, you know, in the 
and the, the supply chain. So what yeah. I think needs to be done, just to get to the point, back to your point about how does this end, uh, how does this stop, I think we need to have hundreds of millions of tests available after two weeks of quarantine. We have to get to a uh, World War II type uh, footing with respect to produ- producing tests. And then after two or three weeks, everybody comes outdoors and, and we have tests of everybody, certainly everybody who's walking around, who's in a business, in a public area, there should be random uh, tests or you should have to have a badge that says you've been tested, you're cleared for a couple of weeks. Uh, I know this seems like Nazi Germany having a badge, but in order for us to, this is not a badge to determine who should be killed. This is a, a, a badge to determine uh, who won't kill you, okay, to keep you safe. So uh, we need to have that kind of a mechanism, as far as I can tell, short of having a vaccine, which is going to take, under the best circumstances, apparently a year. Now, maybe they can fast. Well, let, me, let me just try to get my head around something, because the cost that you're talking about will be measured in the hundreds of billions or the trillions uh, right. to to carry on this program that you're uh, envisioning, even if it's feasible. Uh, but the benefits, how do you reckon that? I mean, well, uh, would you would you say any action was too costly to stymie the rate of increase of the uh, extent of the disease? We should do anything. How, how do we? Where's the trade off? We're economists. Where's the where's the benefit cost calculation, or uh, which well, which uh, makes this a rational uh, uh, course of action? Forty percent. So we're talking about. Um, Sorry, Larry. You need uh, to repeat yourself. We got a bandwidth issue uh, here, and you and you got cut out for like ten seconds. Okay. okay. So I was talking about the benefit yeah, cost we'll calculation. Think about Okay. So yeah, that's what I've been thinking about too. I'm not, you know, I'm I'm very concerned about people's individual health, but I'm thinking about this mostly as an economist for purposes of talking to you because you're hard nosed. I'm hard nosed when it comes to economics. Where, so think about losing 15% of GDP because services is shut down for a year, and that's 70% of our 78% of our GDP. And uh, uh, okay, so the. Um, uh, and maybe 20% of, of services are uh, put down, uh, which is what's happening in China. So 70, let, let's not say that 78% of GDP disappears, but 20% of 78% to be kind of conservative. So we're talking about 15% or so of GDP. So how much is that? So that's about $3 trillion. I would think that uh, we could put together uh, a, that's like bigger than the entire military budget of the U.S., now, if you take the military and put them to work on uh, swabbing people uh, everywhere around the country on a routine basis, every week you have to be swabbed, uh, and you give them some protective gear to do that, and you build the test kits. Uh, that you know, we built uh, entire cargo ships in four days during World War II. So the idea that we can't produce uh, what, what we'll need to have is uh, you know, 300 million, 327 million test kits every week. That's not impossible to produce that number of test kits, kits because they're talking about producing millions of test kits in the next couple of weeks. So the idea of getting ramping up to do 327 every, every week, it should be possible. That's if I were the president, that's what I would be focused on. How do you get to an end game here? Not, you know, let's just do something temporary, lock people up, but then you let them out and you're back in exactly the same boat. It doesn't what, make what is it? I want your uh, opinion now as an epidemiologist. <laughs> what is the characteristic of the current situation, which unlike all other situations that we've confronted in the past, right. warrants this degree of mobilization and infringement well, here, upon individual yeah. liberty? It's not the, okay, it's not the highest... Uh, um, it's got, it's got a, a high contagion rate, contagious rate, contagion rate, uh, and a relatively, uh, and a pretty high death rate. 
it's much higher than the flu. The flu kills has killed a lot more people globally uh, this year, but not everybody got it. The contagion rate is quite high here, and uh, the death rate is at, at best probably two percent. So if you take two percent times uh, seven point six, at best people, the death rate is two percent. In the sense that it's uh, it's uh, the best mind, meaning the the lowest likely global death rate. Well, you and I both know that that can't be true for every person. It's going to have to vary a lot with respect to age and medical condition. So we, do we want to imp- apply the draconian intervention that you're describing to every person when most of us are not going to be to the same degree uh, susceptible to the uh, f- uh, fatal consequences of the disease? Well, I mean, an option that you're laying out implies the first loose, and we'll get what's called herd immunity. Enough people will get it or die. Uh, so that the virus will have no place to go that it hasn't been and where people can't destroy it. And that's the end of the virus. So the problem with that is uh, uh, you could end up with uh, something like 200 million people dead in the world, which is like two World War IIs. I don't know where that number came from. Well, I'm taking the global population multiplying by about 2% because the estimates are uh, maybe it's maybe it's more like 150 million, not not uh, 200 million, but the estimates are that um, it depends on the, on the death rate, but if you use 2%, it'd be about 150 million. Uh, the estimate is about 70% of the world's population would get the, get this if there's no defense uh, against it employed. So I'm saying we, uh, this distancing is quarantining uh, keeping the healthy people away from the sick people is our only defense, but we need to have the knowledge to do that effectively without shutting down the economy. And that's where the continual time de- testing is in, is required. But we've never done this before when there have been pandemics in the past. We've never done anything like this. Again, uh, I, I wonder what is it about the current circumstance that warrants such a draconian uh, practice? Well, uh, no, no. Uh, I mean, I think it's partly social media that uh, they got, we also have the knowledge to prevent deaths. So, I mean, look at Andrew Cuomo said, "If I can, uh, if I can, sh- I have to shut down the state in order to save five thousand deaths. I'm going to do that." He's the he's the governor. He said it's a matter of morality. Uh, and in the past, the leaders were not in the position to be able to, to make that kind of a uh, choice. They didn't have that trade-off because they didn't have the power to save lives. Now we save 40,000. What is it? How many are killed in traffic accidents every year? I mean, it's on the order of magnitude of 40,000 a year. If we shut down the highways, nobody would die on them. Uh, you know, And everybody can see that that's a ridiculous uh, thing to do because, in effect, The 40,000 lives that we lose on highways every year, if that's the number, are the price we're willing to pay to have the convenience of the transport, which the highways allow. We are implicitly sacrificing tens of thousands of lives every year just in order to be able to get the goods in our grocery store under the shelf. There's nothing new in the idea that lives would be sacrificed. Now you're talking about a a kind of mobilization that would... uh, 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 undermine our civil liberties in a profound way. You're going to have to go to war with some of those armed uh, people out there in Utah or Texas or Montana or whatever it is to get them on the, on the reservation. You're going to have to shut down religious congregations who refuse to believe in the expert science that you're trying to inflict on them in the interest of, if, if you can't get stymieing the, uh, the pandemic, if you can't get people to vaccinate their kids how are you going to get them to allow themselves to be tested and wear their badges of certification uh, walking around in the in uh, uh, the cities of this country? It's called uh, it's called force. It's called the military. I mean, this is happening right today in two major countries, Italy and Spain. I have friends who are locked inside or texting me from Rome and locked inside. If they go outside, they're going to get arrested or, or fined, uh, put in jail for a couple of days or fined. So, unfortunately, 
Uh, you know, this and, is a and what with this most of us, how many cases are there? How many did you say there were? Four thousand and something in the U.S. It's about yeah. four thousand. Yeah, in a country of three hundred and thirty million people, and we're going to deploy the military on the streets of the cities to make sure that nobody comes outside of their homes. That doesn't strike you as an overreaction. Okay, Larry. Too late. Everybody will be infected. I'm so sorry. You have to repeat yourself again. The, your bandwidth problem causes you to freeze from time to time. So please sorry. repeat what you just said in reaction to my uh, creeping fascism critique. <laughs> well, I and I love your libertarianism, but let's be clear: this is not uh, libertarians. Don't have a really good answer for public good problems, and this is a public goods problem. I I am self interested. I go outside. In fact, twenty in New York infects people, and he says, "Oh, I don't want to go to the hospital. I don't want to be quarantined." Yeah. With people, and then you have uh, so this is standard public goods. This is a role for economics where we need to compel people to uh, to to not impose externalities, negative uh, damage to other people. Uh, because they're just self-interested. Once I've got the flu or the virus, I'm not concerned about any. My no, I get that. Uh, and excuse uh, me for interrupting. But we got a transmission problem. I get that. I get the idea that a sick individual doesn't have the right incentives to keep away from other people. It's it's unsick individuals that are being uh, dragooned in your scheme, and and that's the thing that I'm that I'm objecting to, or at least I'm expressing a concern about it. It, it, it strikes me as a very high price to pay in terms of our civil well, liberties. And by the way, the precedent will be there forever. Uh, yeah. Uh, if we can have instant testing, uh, this, it's a matter of, let's suppose we had this miraculous test that could be done instantly, a home test kit, and everybody could uh, you know, walk around. It's like a pregnancy test. You could have, you know, this stick in your pocket and you could show anybody who asked uh, a policeman or a uh, or soldier that you actually are, are safe and that you're free to walk around in public. That would be just because then we would be able to do our, you know, get back to work. This is a massive supply shock and a massive demand shock. The supply is that no that large fractions of the workforce are told uh, they can't go to work and and they're too uh, and they're too afraid to go to work. And then we've got masses uh, people who are not uh, going to uh, retail establishments because they know it's too dangerous. So they're being told not to. So. Uh, this is it's actually not too dangerous for most of us to go out to a retail establishment, but it it but it is too dangerous. Uh, excuse me. Um, I lost you there for a minute. Uh, there you are. It's not too dangerous in terms of our personal health, but it is too dangerous in terms of the management of the of the epidemiological dynamic. Uh, right. Do you agree with that? That is, if I step out right now from my home, I can see Thayer Street, which is a main drag. There are plenty of good restaurants. All of them are closed. Uh, and I walk down to the CVS and get myself a mask. Well, I would if they had any, but they're sold out. I don't think I myself materially increase the chance that I'm going to get sick. And I'm not sick. Therefore, I don't believe I'm increasing anybody else's chance of getting sick. But if everybody goes out of their home and goes to the restaurant and goes to the CVS, among them will be some sick people and that will promote the spread of the virus. So to keep us all safe, we all need to stay in our homes, but not because there's a personal risk to any one of us from violating that stricture, I'd say. Well, it's a small, small number, large number problem, right? Each one of us has a small probability, but collectively, we have a large probability of spreading the virus if we all act together. And then, and then it really does exponentially spread from there. So the, the real answer here is technology. We have to have testing. Uh, no, we, we have to be testing people all the time for a while. 
in order for people to to be for us to function as a society and an economy. Uh, I don't see. Do you see any other solution, Glenn? I mean, you're. As no, I, I don't. I mean, I, I I don't have a solution. I'm not going to lie about that. Uh, I have a concern. My concern is that some solutions may do more harm than they do good. And my concern is that we need a framework for being able to evaluate proposed solutions in terms not only of their uh, disease reducing benefits, but also in terms of their economic costs. Uh, and like I say, there is a limit on how much economic costs we'd be willing to pay at the margin to uh, reduce the extent of the disease uh, by one doesn't want to say that every life is of infinite value. But as a matter of fact, as a matter of economic reality, we constantly make decisions. We decide to dig the coal mine, even though we know that in an actuarial sense, it's going to have Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the consequence of some miners dying, et cetera. So, um, yeah, I wanted to shift from our discussion about how to deal with the uh, epidemiological threat of the pandemic to how to deal with the economic downturn that we are going to be experiencing as a result of the pandemic. I know you've also been writing about that. You think the stock market is going to fall 50% from its high. Uh, That would be catastrophic for people like me who, unlike you are not sitting on millions and millions of dollars, but uh, (laughs) (laughs) I wish what can, I wish what can be done that. about it? What can be done? Uh, what do you think uh, the stimulus package ought to look like? What should the Fed be doing? Uh, do uh, the administration and Congress have their heads on straight as they talk about how to mitigate this? Should, who should be bailed out? Uh, you know, what, what role should the government play, if any, in mitigating the collapse in the financial markets? What do you think? Well, that's a good question there. I think that unless we have a game plan for how to get control of this, an end game, like I'm talking about, which is quarantine for a couple of weeks, make sure it doesn't spread beyond where, uh, where it's gone, and then a vast amounts of testing for everybody, compulsory every week with badges. Uh, that's that is a game plan. I have heard nobody in the entire planet enunciate a game plan for how this ends, apart from some vaccine which may come. But if it doesn't come, we need something else. So that's what the that's what the entire government should be focused on, making that happen. They're not talking about that. Uh, Trump's just said, I think today that we should uh, stay away from groups of ten or more people. Well, I don't know what that means because I could see you and then see uh, nine other people sequentially and have the same exposure. So it, it just just another uh, really ridiculous proposition from somebody who's living in a, fan, a fantasy life that doesn't connect to our world. So well, let me just know, let me just know that a 10 sequential one-on-one meetings between you and 10 other people is not the same thing as 10 people getting together in the same room, because in that latter scenario, each one of those 10 is exposed to nine other people. Whereas in your scenario, the nine other people are only exposed to you. So I just, you know, let's keep our arithmetic straight. <laughs> Well, that's true, but those other nine people may go off and see another. Well, then that would be another hypothetical. But okay, anyway. So, um, so, so then we have the Fed. So we're not doing anything to calm people's uh, uh, expect or change people's expectations of complete meltdown, which is what we've got in everybody's brain at this point. So we have the Fed trying to uh, pretend that. Reducing interest rates, which are already uh, incredibly low, yeah. is going to make a difference to anything. I mean, uh, it will let people uh, potentially re- even there. Are, you know, mortgage rates really haven't come down, so I was thinking this might help people refinance their homes. But the mortgage rates haven't come come down. Not yet. Not yet. But if you think about what's going on here, we have basically the financial system freezing up because just like in 2008, because the Fed has already pumped in like $1.5 trillion, well beyond really what they did in 2008, from what I gather, in uh, basically saying, look, if Bank A uh, isn't going to a repo, lend to Bank B, you know, Bank A had this deal to uh, lend to Bank B at the end of the day, and Bank B thinks that Bank A may be in bad shape and doesn't want to... Uh, 
Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. No, that's okay. I got it. Yeah. Um, so what the Fed's doing is coming in and lending to Bank B. Well, and but the difference, if I may, uh, isn't it that there aren't so many toxic assets on the balance sheets of these banks? The, the underlying fundamental uh, financial situation is less shaky than it was in 2007, 2008. Well, yes and no, because a lot of these banks have corporate bonds. Corporates, uh, corporations are significantly more leveraged than they were, or at least as leveraged as they were back in 2008. And a much larger share of their debt is rated triple B, which is highly risky. So in some ways, we're back in 2008 where we have, it's not that these banks have uh, mortgages which are viewed as dicey, which I, by the way, I don't think that they actually were dicey. If yeah, I know. We, talked about we, that. we have discussed that here at the Glenn Show. But um, yeah, and for viewers, they could uh, go to my website, kotlikoff.net, and then read a paper called The Big Con. It's under, um, there's 100 articles, 100 columns. But yeah, I strongly but, recommend it. We discussed it here, I don't know, six months ago or so. But the, uh, so, uh, the banks are actually potentially in big in big trouble. The fact that they've been passing these stress tests is not uh, not reassuring because if you go back to 2008, uh, Bear Stearns and J- and, uh, and Lehman Brothers would both have passed the, the current stress test with flying col- colors, actually. And the SEC chairman said that right at the time, right back in 2008, they testified publicly that uh, these banks were in good good shape. So if there's a run yeah. on the bank, it becomes immaterial what the actual underlying situation of the bank is. But there are things to worry about objectively with respect to the bank's balance sheets. And now we have the, you know, the fact that the Fed has moved in with $1.5 trillion means that the banking system is yet again frozen up. Because why would they have to do that? Uh, intervention, which is in large part in the repo market, which is the short-term borrowing market, because the banks are not lending to the banks. The ones who have extra money to lend or, and and had agreed to lend, uh, J.P. Morgan had agreed to lend to uh, Franklin Trust or whatever company that might be, or Cambridge Trust, uh, and it doesn't do it because it doesn't trust uh, uh, the solvency of, of, the, yeah. of the bank. So, so the Fed has moved in uh, in that manner, but cutting the interest rates is just uh, a, kind of a silly thing to do in this context. Well, we really it's all they got, to, right? It's, yeah. it's the Fed. It's all they. What about fiscal stimulus? Well, let's just talk so a little bit, just a little bit more about uh, monetary policy. If you are doing what the Fed has done, printing one point five trillion dollars that is getting into the money supply, M1. So if you go to the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis and look at the M1 money supply chart, you'll see, and then you look at the chart of prices, you'll see that money has increased dramatically, M1, relative to prices. So what we have, we've had for quite a while, but we've really uh, goosed up the potential here for inflation. And inflation means high long-term interest rates and so the fact that uh, the yield on long-term bonds hasn't dropped at the same time the Fed has reduced short-term rates. Tells us that the investors are afraid of infa- inflation. Yes, inflation. And then, you know, now the fiscal policy, uh, the government's already running a trillion-dollar deficit. If the government does what the Democrats have been pushing for, which is ensuring everybody's wages, you know, Somebody who's uh, or small business is uh, being able to maintain, uh, you know, pay their lease, leases, uh, or restaurants being able to, you know, pay their employees. Oh, that's you know, we're talking about trillions of dollars. We're talking about increasing the deficit by a trillion or two to keep the economy, keep people liquid for a couple of months maybe four months. And then the question is, where does the government come up with that money? Uh, the debt to GDP ratio will go from like 75, 78% to more like 90%, probably pretty quickly. Well, and, if we were at war, that something like that would happen too, right? We'd, we'd uh, tough it out and then we'd, uh, we'd recover after the fact. 
well, especially if the fundamentals, if, if, if real productivity hadn't been destroyed, if factories weren't bombed, if, if workers weren't killed, skilled workers, we should be able to get back on track. Well, if you had a country that's fiscally responsible, that was paying its bills in good times, uh, it would be one thing. But if you have a country that's uh, totally fiscally irresponsible, has all the enormous amount of off-the-book liabilities, uh, large and growing on-the-book liabilities, uh, and then on top of that, you layer this, and all you see is money creation, the Fed printing bond, you know, the, the Treasury borrowing money. I borrow, I'm the Treasury. I borrow money from you. I give you a IOU. The Fed prints money and buys back the IOU. Now, what's happened is I bought something from you, and maybe it's food to hand out down the street, uh, and uh, or I, I borrowed money to give to somebody who lost their job. Uh, either in, you know, so I give them money, something in kind or, or in cash. And now the Fed has just bought up the IOU. So you're sitting up. So what I did is I got money from you and you got the money, you got the extra money, the same amount of money I took from you. You were handed back that money by the Federal Reserve. So now we have twice the amount of money that we had before sitting there. You know, if I borrow a hundred, a thousand and the Fed prints a thousand, so I take your thousand, I give you a piece of paper, the Fed comes and prints a thousand and takes away your piece of paper, leaves you with a thousand. We now have two thousand dollar bills floating in the economy, and we have the same smaller amounts of goods because we have no production. So we're gonna have inflation, reduction in supply, increase in money. So we have a lot more money chasing fewer goods. That's okay, I gotta I'm I'm channeling Paul Krugman here, and I don't often do that. Uh, this is one of his zombie economic ideas. You know this argument he makes? He says there's some bad and wrong ideas that just keep coming back and you can't kill them no matter what you do. And one of them is that deficit spending is going to cause inflation and that big budget deficits are a problem. There are no such problem. Uh, right-wing economists, of which you are not one, uh, have been, this is Krugman, have been telling us for decades that inflation was right around the corner. And guess what? It hasn't happened yet, and it's not going to happen either. Uh, so what, what do you say to Krugman? So here's the answer to that. There's two factors that are involved with inflation. Uh, one is uh, the money supply, and the other is the, the rate at which it circulates in the economy, the speed, the velocity mm-hmm. of money. So the velocity at the same time after t- 2008, the money supply has gone up, and it's re- just in the last year or two, it's gone up dramatically in the last couple of months or weeks. Uh, but the velocity has gone down dramatically, and that's why the price level hasn't gone up. Now, the velocity is very much a function of people's expectations of inflation and also you know, connected to that, the interest rate, because if there's a high nominal, high interest rate, long-term interest rate, I don't want to hold my money and there's high inflation. I don't want to hold cash because I'll just lose it. You know, I'll lose this high interest, and the money will become watered down. By inflation, so then money becomes a hot potato, and velocity goes up. So when you have lots of money and the potential for velocity to go from way down here, historically low values, up to something normal, then you have the potential for prices to go up dramatically. So that's what I would explain to Paul that uh, he 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 should understand, uh, because he's a terrific economist, that expectations of inflation and uh, the level of long-term nominal interest rates uh, are going to drive velocity and faster money is like more money. So we're going to have a lot more money. And if we speed up that, the circulation of the money, we're going to have inflation. Now this is not hypothetical. We had 22 hyperinflations in the last century. We had, and why not, in, not in the United States, but throughout the world. We had Israel, we had Russia, we had Hungary, yeah. we had Germany, Weimar Republic. Uh, Zimbabwe, yeah, Venezuela, Argentina. Argentina, Venezuela. Yeah. This is not uh, accidental. You know, when people stop moving, losing faith in the U.S., if they think that there's some there's irresponsible uh, government, uh, they will start turning in the, the dollar into a hot potato, and that'll be what we'll see. We had uh, inflate. I believe we had inflation after World War II in the in the U.K. At some point, you know, things flip from using the pound to the dollar, right? Because the UK wasn't viewed as 
the, yeah. the pound wasn't viewed as a stable currency in sense in the sense that the people managing it were not being responsible. Okay, let, let me see if I'm understanding because I can even remember from my undergraduate monetary economics course the identity M times V equals P times Q. These Money supply velocity. times the velocity equals the price level times the output. So that's a tautology, right? That's a that's almost like a definition of velocity. Uh, so what you said must be true. If the money supply has gone up and the price level hasn't gone up, it can only be because the velocity has gone down. Yeah. But the question is, what are the behavioral underpinnings of velocity? And you've, uh, you've anchored that in expectations. And you're saying that that's a fragile situation, which could flip at any moment. And Krugman could be right every day until he's wrong. And when he's wrong, it'll be a catastrophe. Exactly. Now, if you look at this, one of the best papers ever written by economists was this a paper by Tom Sargent, I think a co-author, called The End of Four Great Inflations. And I don't know it. It shows you the power of, ex- it's, re- it's a beautiful paper, easily read. Uh, it talks about four hyperinflations and how they came to an end. So here you had the government, like in Weimar Republic, printing, uh, you know, tons and tons of, uh, of marks every year. Yeah minute, people are getting paid in wheelbarrows full of marks, and they had to run to the store to spend them yeah. in order to uh, get something real, because at the end of the day, right. the wheelbarrow would be worthless because inflation was so high. Uh, so what happened was that at some point, uh, the government changed in Germany, and people who, uh, there was a declaration of a responsible fiscal policy that was going to be adapted. Uh, adopted over the next few months and years. And all of a sudden, uh, velocity changed. And uh, in the rate of increase of prices fell. So we had lower inflation, and then ultimately got down to reasonable inflation. Uh, but the interesting thing, Glenn, is that the uh, printing of money actually accelerated during this period. Inflation comes down, because people were listening to what the politicians were saying. They weren't actually looking at what the uh, monetary authorities were doing. Take, okay, so this happened four places. So it's all about expectations. Velocity is all about expectations. Uh, think about what happened with um, Paul Volcker in 78 when he announced, I think it was 78 or 79, when he said he was going to target the money supplies. We had this inflation, 10% inflation in our country. Paul Volcker, yeah. that just deceased. Uh, tr- fantastic uh, former head of the Re- Federal Reserve and yeah. uh, somebody who I had the pleasure of meeting, uh, privilege of meeting a couple of times. Mm-hmm. Um, so he announces this thing. He says, we're, well, we're going to target M1, M2, M3. Here's the targets for the next three years. The market goes absolutely crazy. He doesn't do it. You know, from one minute to the next, the market goes crazy. The interest rates go from like 10% up to 20%. Uh, and he just sticks to his – he doesn't change any of his statements. But if you look at what happened, uh, the economy goes into recession. Uh, we have um, – people believe what he's saying, that there's not going to be inflation. So inflation comes down, not a mat, dramatic, not immediately, but gradually. It does start to come down. And if you look at, at the actual targets – and whether Volcker met those targets or hit those targets, he missed them all. It's like there was no change in monetary policy. It was all his language. He said some words, everything changed, nothing real changed in terms of his policy. Now, if you go to an undergraduate textbook, you will see discussion of Volcker's uh, reduction of the money supply. It's not in the data. You go to my friend Greg Mankiw's textbook, which is like the leading t- undergraduate textbook, he'll talk about the Volcker episode and uh, this great experiment in uh, or great action in monetary policy, how the guy cuts the money supply and it reduces inflation. Not the case. It changed velocity. And exp- that's, that's how things mod- changed. So velocity here could take off tomorrow. And I think... Uh, That'll be my next column, you know, that we need to worry about in- inflation taking off and long-term interest rate shooting up. And uh, Okay, I look forward to that. What about fiscal policy? And uh, maybe uh, we can wrap up with that. Yeah, well, fiscal policy, you wouldn't want to give uh, payroll tax cuts to people that have jobs because they're the lucky ones. 
what you want to do is try and help people that have lost their are going to lose their jobs. We're going to have massive layoffs, uh, much, I think, far beyond anything we saw in 2008. And people that can't pay their mortgages, it's going to be very difficult to figure out who those people are. But to the extent that we give people help, we should do it that way. It doesn't, it's not like uh, if I got a payroll tax cut right now, that I would go out to um, Lord and Taylor's downtown in Boston and go look for a new suit because I'm afraid to walk in that store. I've been told it's dangerous. So what is it I'm going to do? I'm going to, if I buy anything, it's going to be on Amazon. So it's, it's money going from the government to, to Jeff Bezos pocket. Uh, what is the sense of this? This is not, yeah. in some context, uh, cutting payroll taxes might make sense. If everybody, if this was like a normal recession, people were freaked out for some reason, they wanted some assurance that the government was doing something. Even no, I get it. Yeah. Uh, it's, that seems like a really important observation. It's that you want to make sure you target the uh, assistance to the people whose uh, incomes are going to take a hit because they're the ones whose spending will be influenced and it'll help you keep aggregate demand up. Yeah. Do you want to, do you want to make sure that uh, establishments don't have to close their doors? Small businesses that would go bankrupt because their revenues have fallen short and they can't pay the rent. Uh, and pay their employees. You want to make sure those employees stay in place because otherwise you suffer the huge adjustment costs when we come out of this, which we will uh, at some point come out of this, but then those storefronts will have been repurposed and those skills will have atrophied and those employees will be needing to find other employers. Uh, if we could just hold everybody in place for three months or six months, if that's how long it takes, we could avoid having to do all that restructuring. Is, well, does that make sense? This makes sense in the context of actually having a plan for after, you know, an, an, an end game, going back to our beginning of our discussion. Mm -hmm. We don't have a plan for what to do two weeks from now after we lock everybody up, after we've told them today they can't congregate in groups of 10, which is really closing every restaurant in the country, yeah. telling every restaurant in the country to close, every movie theater, every uh, sports event, everything, yeah. school, uh, Everything now is going to be closed down and involves more than 10 people. Coffee shops, uh, you know, we can't keep them going. Uh, it's one thing to, tr to risk inflation, print money to keep them and hope that velocity will stay low. Keep that all going uh, for a few weeks and then have a game plan for coming out of it. It's another to keep it going and end up three weeks from now in exactly the same boat. What's the point? We have to have a solution for the, and that requires testing. And that requires uh, somebody saying why we can't make 327 million tests, do those once a week, why we can't do what we did in World War II, which is do the impossible. Okay. If we don't get control of the public health problem, all the economic finagling won't matter. Well, and and in order to get control of the public health problem, this is the wisdom of Larry Kotlikoff, everybody. We need universal, regular testing that's compulsory. Right. And uh, compulsory isolation of people who test positive. If we could sustain that for a period of time, we'd nip this thing in the bud and we'd be back on track sooner rather than later. Right. And we won't, we won't go bankrupt in the, pro in the process and we won't have a financial meltdown, which is still likely still possible. All right. Well, that's the wisdom of Larry Kavikoff, everybody. Make of it what you will. Uh, I'm going to take it seriously, if not follow it, uh, in it to uh, every degree. <laughs> Larry, I, want you to stay, I want you to stay inside because uh, if you get this thing, libertarianism is not going to save you. <laughs> well, I know that neither is my Christianity, although I may continue to avow both. <laughs> Be my guest. Just stay the hell inside, okay? And keep Luan. All right, can I go out for a bike ride, Larry, as long as I don't stop at the coffee shop? Yes, bike ride. Yes, that's okay. fine. Okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Larry Kotlikov. Take care. This is fun. Take care. Bye-bye.